Hi everyone, the personality we have with us today don't need any introduction. So thank you so much Mukda ma'am for joining Inquotub Media. Inquotub team and I are really honored to have you here. No, thank you so much ma'am. Thank you so thank much, so much yeah. ma'am. So ma'am starting from your uh, career and one of the incident of the Junjun district yeah. to heading department of science and technology. So can you share us your journey as secretary uh, DST Rajasthan and what is your long term vision to enrich science and research in the ecosystem? Oh, thank you so much for asking that question actually. So I'm about uh, uh, seven months old, let's say in the department and we are currently uh, doing Rajasthan's first uh, uh, festival of science and we are calling it uh, Vigyan Utsav 2020. Uh, 20. And uh, we started on the 13th of Feb, uh, uh, which is the National Women's Day. And we will end with uh, the National Science Day on the 28th of Feb. So the idea, basically, the vision as I see for my uh, department and for all the stakeholders, right from the student, the child student, including the girl child student, uh, to the scholar and the researcher, uh, to institutions, to colleges and universities, so we are very much like LIC, you know, Life Insurance Corporation of India, right from the cradle to the grave. We have so many schemes. Uh, uh, so the idea basically is one, to demystify science, uh, to popularize science, to use science as an instrument in the service of society to solve real life problems. So my job as an administrator in the STEM or science field is basically to facilitate all the work that the scientists, the researchers, the students, the institutions, our stakeholders would like to do. So my idea is not to do the science work, but to ensure uh, through policy architecture and design and planning and coordination and meetings and brainstormings to understand the expectations of the stakeholders and to provide, um, you know, work as a catalyst, as a facilitator to provide institutionalized structures and regimes, policy regimes. So whether I remain in the department or not, uh, the seed uh, will be sown so deep, embedded so deep in the psyche of the department's understanding and in the state psyche, that things will just go on uh, and people will be able to achieve what they need to do. So one of the things uh, that uh, uh, pertains is one to you know take science to the people popularize it because people who are working in uh, the labs are working in silos, right? So the common man really doesn't appreciate. And technology, science and innovation is so embedded in our lives, in our everyday lives. But the people who are doing all those innovations are somewhere at the back end of things. And uh, they feel, they don't feel validated enough. So I think we are bringing them out of the silos. We are also doing a whole lot of institution, institution to institution connect. We are also doing a whole lot of breaking the silos in the government and doing interdepartmental things for science, uh, incentivizing people uh, where there's a lack of vision, we are providing that vision, where there's a lack of financial uh, resources, we are providing, we are connecting, um, uh, you know, our institutions and our students and scholars and researchers to places where the, uh, those monies, those fundings, can be made available and of course there's a lot of startup and entrepreneurship which is evolving from the science itself. So we are focusing on all these kind of things through our various gamut of schemes that we have. Um, you have rightly said we have to empower research and we have to popularize it at the like grassroots bachelor level and all. Mm -hmm. So one of the scheme I was going through that was also or argumentating research for writing skills for uh, Research. Articulating yeah. uh, research. So, what uh, a long term vision and impact do you see with that scheme? Oh, so, a uh, good question again, I would say, because uh, uh, I don't exactly remember the month, but uh, I think two or three months after I joined the department, we did a program, which is also the program that we did for the first time uh, ever in the department, which was we did a science journalism workshop. And it was in keeping with the goal that we had that we must popularize science, we must take science to the people, to the common people. And how do we do it? Because we are sitting in an age of uh, social media. So we decided that our, our media, the people who carry the news to the people, also need to understand science. Because, on, because science is a very erudite, uh, in terms of perception, is a very erudite, full of techni technical uh, jargon, which people, yeah. a layman doesn't understand. understand. So even the kind of researchers, researchers which come out, 
you know, have very difficult kind of uh, jargon which is embedded. So how does a common man understand? So it was very necessary to teach the uh, students of mass communication, uh, our public relations officers who work in our departments in the government, and also people from the press, both the print, electronic and social media, who cover science stories. Uh, so we held a two-day workshop with experts who taught how to make films on science, how to how to write about uh, articles which have been published, how to simplify research uh, proposals in exactly. easy language yeah. so that people know that this research is not something you know complicated, but something. So how to simplify it for the people? And I think after we held that workshop, which was exactly taking on from what Government of India does in Afsar. Mm -hmm. So in Afsar, they teach the researchers to write the research proposals. So we went a step ahead. We said, okay. you are writing science uh, proposals, you're simplifying stories. We also want the common people to get associated with science, to be able to come up with short, under five minute films on science in easy language. So to become the bridge between the scientists and the society, that was the idea. And I think after we held that workshop and we also announced some that we'll be giving journalists, you know, prizes and awards and stuff like that. There's a lot of coverage of DST in the last six months, which has never happened before in the last 46 months of its existence. If you educate the people, I think uh, uh, it enables you uh, to make your department's job the job of everybody else. You know? exactly. So this is what I'm trying to do. So it's not my, my job alone yes, as secretary in the government. It's everybody's job yeah. because science works for everybody. So I'm trying to do that as part of my remit that I have today. Exactly, ma'am. We from Inkpada are also doing the same. Uh, like we are enriching, we are empowering research, bringing awareness among the bachelor students. What is the benefit of research in the future? So that is why I'm giving you an interview, no? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, my next question is related to that one. We okay. as a corporate, you as a government, are working on the similar lines, yeah. and many other companies are doing the same. Yeah. So, what, how uh, a corporates as well as government body can work together to empower research in the ecosystem? Because you have just participated in our uh, Vigyan Utsav and you've seen that this Vigyan Utsav, uh, we are all witnesses uh, in this entire process. This entire event has been a collaborative effort between uh, the public, which is us at the government level, all our stakeholders and the private sector. Uh, researchers, the scholars and students, school and college who are studying in different public and private universities who were all here. And yes, you've been exactly, witness exactly. to what you've seen here. And you yourself as an entrepreneur has gone up on the stage and spoken about your import, a platform which we have provided to you, sir, in the government. Exactly. So collaboration is already happening. Exactly. And we've only met you some 10 days, 10, 12 days 10 back, back, right? So you've immediately got, in the government things, at least in I my have department, never seen are so far, fast. So far, <laughs> so far, I have never seen so far. <laughs> Uh, recently, in the last year, August, uh, a rule came. MHRD has uh, mandated mm -hmm. to all for all professors to have PhD. Mm -hmm. So, what are your views on that initiative? See, okay, um, we have to understand that I am very happy uh, about one thing: that governments are becoming very fungible and flexible in their policy, and a lot of experimentation is happening based on past. Uh, you know, experiences, experience. which is exactly what science says. Science says, please observe, please have curiosity, please question, please experiment. And science also allows you to fail, do a lot of things on pilot project. So I think when new policies come, uh, like the ones which have come right now, we should not only look at it in one pointed manner, as you said, professors are supposed to do PhDs. So the quality of PhD is one thing. Uh, exactly. The reason for doing a PhD is another thing. But right now, in my interactions, what I have seen is, so there was a time when you needed leniency because you needed to fill up gaps, which are totally administrative thing. You have, see, after 2005, three or five, a lot of private universities under the Private Universities Act started coming up. So there was a proliferation. Why you needed a proliferation? You needed a proliferation because you uh, had raised an ambition. You had made your own uh, teeming middle class aspirational. So they wanted to ch send their children, including the girl child, to colleges to do better, right? So you needed many more colleges to be able to absorb that intake of your aspirational middle class. Exactly. And even of the people who were moving from the villages to the city, even people in the villages who wanted to do higher studies, right? So that's a good thing. 
So for about 15, 20 years, they did that. And that was the time when they realized that if you have to fill up the vacancies in the college, because you have infrastructure physical, mm -hmm. but you need to have human resources. So they said that if we look at people doing PhDs, so pre-independence, we only had 120 PhDs in the country, just 120 PhDs between 1920 to about 1940s, 40, 45s. So almost 120, there's nothing, nothing, nothing right? Now today, I am told that there are about 24,000 uh, PhDs which come out uh, in, in the country, which is good. So at that point in time, when this proliferation was happening, it was decided that we need to relax uh, the criteria for people who were uh, being taken on board as assistant professors. So they said that at the level of assistant professors, you can come into the system without having a PhD, right? But when you go for your next promotion, for which you have a sufficient number of times and you also have uh, educational teaching experience, you can do a PhD, right? Today they have said it's mandatory for people to do PhDs because see, it's the dem it's a need of the time, right? So we need to take it in that sense. Also, I feel that it was a good decision for the assistant professors at that point in time to not have a PhD. So when I was studying in college, I did my thesis, an MPhil thesis, uh, but I didn't do a PhD, I came into the job. Uh, and I look back today and I find that it's good I didn't do a PhD then because my level of understanding at that point in time was limited. Today with all the exposure, I'll be able to do a better set, you know, a better job with my PhD. So maybe at that point in time, the decision is okay. So more than, and also when you do these, um, uh, what you say, selections, you need to have a criteria because you also need to have transparency in the government system. Okay. So uh, I find that this was the need of the hour. Uh, today, maybe we'd, we've seen what the assistant professors with or without PhDs mm -hmm. have probably contributed. And I'm sure it is emerging from some kind of statistical data uh, uh, which I'm not privy to. Uh, so I will say that it's okay, but maybe uh, you could also look at people coming into the system, learning from the system, getting exposed to the system, and then also doing a PhD. I'm, I'm fine with that. But uh, since the government has come up with a policy, I think I'm sure there must be some reason for it. And we can also toy with this system, experiment with the system and see. And we can always change it. I mean, it is, why are we so anti-change? Because change is the only constant <laughs> thing in life. So we should be happy. This was the question I was uh, looking forward uh, to you. Uh, all the audiences, uh, mm -hmm. professors, potential researchers, students. So any message do you have for them? Oh, so I will... Can I uh, uh, just uh, give you a little gist of a poem which I like very sure, much? Sure, ma'am. Sure, sure. Which carries exactly the message that probably I like to convey. Uh, so there is a very nice poem by Kamla Das called Fame. That poem basically talks about how and why you should concentrate on making the food. So it writes that uh, the aroma coming out of the food that you cook is exactly, fame is exactly like that, right? So you should focus on the work that you are doing because if your work is good, the word of mouth publicity, just like the aroma, will take you to where you're supposed to go. You will get all the validation, you will get everything and you will be spotted by the right people. So just focus on the work that you're doing. And I think I will also say something that please read, expose yourselves to different, um, you know, uh, streams of thought. Just because you are a science student doesn't mean that you will not read arts. You know, don't have a value judgment in your being, in yourself. Because when you drop this whole thing about value judgment, you are able to absorb things. Uh, just put it in one word and that would be the message for everybody. So use the empirical thinking or experience of your stakeholders and mix it with your critical thinking. And then you will see with the streams, with the two thought processes coming together, the empirical evidence and the critical thinking, you will have very, very well-defined 
and useful uh, outcome for times to come. Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your golden views and ideas and your guidance with us. Not at all. It, Pleasure. It will really help all our viewers as well as me and my team. Thank you for this opportunity. It was very lovely speaking to you.